good section of that involving two populations with the difference between population proportions. And so we will start off with that. A good example of that would just be if you wanted to check whether or not, say you're a company that's marketing in two cities and you want to tell whether or not there's a difference between your market share in those two cities. So Sydney and, and Halifax, for example, or Yarmouth and Truro, you could say, you know, what is, what is our market share? And, and what you could do in each of these populations is to take a sample and determine to what extent customers are either purchasing your product versus uh, the competitor's product. But that would just be sample data, and then you want to actually test whether or not there's a difference between those population proportions. So to illustrate that, I want us to do an example. And what I've done is in, let me see if I can share my screen with you. I'll go here. In, um, in Brightspace, I've sort of put in, let's see if we could go back here. Did I come out of Brightspace? I think it's over here, right. So if you look, if you go into Brightspace and under our sort of uh, classroom problems, where do I have it? Uh, it's uh, here, class problems and Excel files. If you could go under your Brightspace um, account, you should find a problem here that says chapter 12, 10 and 12 questions and chapter 10 and 12 questions, no answers. So let's open the no answers one so that we don't cheat. And of course, this one has answers, all right? So we'll open that one. And we're going to take a look at a problem involving proportions. So let us uh, open that up. I'll give you a chance to open that file. I'll stop this share because I'm going to need now my iPad and share that with you. All right. So you should be seeing my iPad right now. I'll just make sure I still have access to the chats in case anybody is chatting, sending me messages. All right, put that on the side. All right, so here's a question. If you're able to pull that up, those of you who are here, um, if you open up that file, you'll see question number five. All right, question number five. And question number five is as follows. So just give me an indication that you have that. At least one person tell me, yes, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have that file? Okay, I'm gonna assume that you have the file. Okay, so the problem reads as follows. Uh, Nova Corporation wanted to know what is the market share, it, what, what, what its market share is in the Nova Scotian market for cheddar cheeses. Last month, a random sample of 380 customers, all of whom had purchased some type of cheddar cheese, was drawn from all across Nova Scotia. 76 of these consumers had purchased Nova Cheddar. So using alpha is equal to 5% in a p-value approach, is there any evidence to suggest that the sales staff have exceeded the company's objectives of securing 12% of the market for cheddar, for cheddar cheeses in Nova Scotia? So in other words, the company had set a, a, mar a sort of a market a target of 12%, are you doing marketing right now? Um, and 12%, um, and, and it took a sample of 380 and found 76 of that 380 had purchased its cheddar. Question is, does that 76 represent um, a 12% or more market share, right? 
So that's what we want to actually figure out. Now, the question is, is this a two population problem or is it a one population problem? So sometimes in these questions, we'll actually give you multiple parts and uh, one part could be a single sample problem and the other parts could be two sample problems. So it's very important that you're able to read and, and, and identify whether or not you're dealing with a multiple, uh, so, uh, two sample problem or a single sample problem, all right? Good, so in this case, we just have a single sample because we took 380 customers and then consumers, and then we found 76 of them had purchased Nova Cheddar. So using alpha is equal to 5% of p-value approach, is there evidence to suggest that the sales staff have exceeded the expectations? So what is it that they want? They want 12%. So we're going to assume that the true proportion is 12%. And now we're going to try to find evidence that it is more than 12%. All right. So the way we work this is we would say, I remember we have about five steps that I normally go through. So the first one is to state the hypotheses. Step one. Hypotheses. So it would be HO, the market target has been exceeded versus HA, it, sorry, HO um, is that it has not exceeded the market target. HA, it has exceeded because that's actually what they want to do. They want to exceed the market target. So HA, the target for the market is exceeded versus target is not exceeded. So if the target is not exceeded, HO, that means the population proportion, which is the market share, should be less than or equal to 12%. If they've exceeded their target, then the true proportion should be greater than 12%. All right, any questions? If you have questions, let me know. So that's the first step. The second step is the test statistic. How are we going to test whether or not um, we've achieved this? So the sampling distribution since you're going to take a, a, pop, a sample from the population and observe the sample proportion, the sampling distribution we are interested in is the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. In which case, what is the shape of that sampling distribution? What's the nature of it? If the sample proportion times n is greater than five and one minus p bar is times n is also greater than five, then we could use the normal approximation to the binomial. You remember that we had that rule, right? So second step. Second step is to get the test statistic, step two. Test statistic. And in that case, it would be Z is equal to sample P bar minus P square root of P one minus P over N. So that is the test statistic because just a single sample problem and the sampling distribution of the sample proportion is a normal distribution. In case you're not sure, remember that we have to just show N times P is greater than or equal to five n times one minus p is also greater than or equal to five. In that case, p gets its value from the null hypothesis, which is 12%. So 0.12 times in our sample size in this problem is 380. 12% of 380 we know is definitely greater than five because 10% of 380 is 38. So therefore 12% would be larger. So that's definitely greater than five. And then 88% of 380 would also be greater than five. So the condition is satisfied 
and therefore we could use the normal approximation to the binomial. So that's our test statistic. What is our decision rule? The decision rule is determined by the maximum risk that we want to take in committing type one error. What is that maximum risk? That maximum risk is alpha. The maximum risk of committing type one error. So the size of your rejection region will be whatever alpha is. So for this particular problem, we want to use a 5%, 5% value for alpha, or in other words, a 5% significance level. That is the limit that we will set. Because this sampling distribution is a normal distribution, so I could draw it. And is it a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? If we go back to the, if we go back to the hypotheses, we'll see here that we have a direction in our alternate hypothesis. It's pointing to the right. We want evidence that the market share is greater than 12%. So we, we're not interested in 10%, 8%, 6%. We want 12, 15, 20, 30, and so on. So that pushes us to the right of the distribution. If that pushes us to the right of the distribution, the point at which we get support for the null hypothesis is in the right tail, not the left tail. So it's a one tail test, and it's a right tail. And I mentioned to you, look for the, that, that use this as like an arrow. So right, left, and then of course not equal to, would be both sides, right? Okay, so if I were to draw this, my rejection region is over to the right. And so let's just shade that in. This value will be alpha, 0 0.05. When alpha is 0 0.05, the critical value of Z, Z critical, 5 and 5, 10%, 90%, 90% confident in this interval is 1.645. So 1.645. So that's just Z critical. If you don't believe me, just go to the table. This is 5%. This area would be 95%. And then you could look it up in the table and prove that the Z value the Z critical value is 1.645. So our decision rule is if my Z observed is greater than or equal to 1.645, I can reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, fail to reject HL. So that is the decision rule. Or if we wanted to use the p-value approach, all we need to say is that if the p-value is less than alpha, or if the p-value is less than 5%, reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, fail to reject the null hypothesis. So that's step three. Once you get those first three steps, then the other two just follows, all right? So we are looking at step four, the analysis step. And so Z observed is P bar. So what's P bar? So we need to calculate P bar. Our sample is 76 over 380 which is 0.2020%. So our sample evidence looks pretty good. 20% is a lot bigger than 12%. So 0 0.20 minus P, which is from the null hypothesis, 12%. And then we use P, one minus 12% over 380. If you compute that, you get a fairly large Z value of 4.8. So this sample is 4.8 standard deviations away from the mean. That's 
a fair distance. Because remember we said what an outlier is, typically by the time you get to about two. But for us, because we're using alpha is 5%, an outlier is 1.645 standard deviations or more. 4.8 is a lot bigger than 1.645, so we safely can recheck the null hypothesis because 4.8 is larger than 1.645. Let's find a p-value as well. P-value is the probability that Z will exceed 4.8. If the null hypothesis is true, well, our table doesn't quite go that far. I believe it, the smallest value that we, the largest value is 3.09. Some other tables in the, on, on the internet will give you up to four point something, but we know that it is less than 0 0.001. So that's our p-value and we have our z-value. So step five, our decision and our conclusion. Uh, since 4.8, that's a classical approach, is greater than 1.645, or you could say it, since the p-value, 0 0.001, is less than, and is much less than 0 0.05, we will reject the null hypothesis, right? If you reject the null hypothesis, then we conclude. Remember, the rejection is just your decision. The conclusion is always with respect to HA. Either you have sufficient evidence to support it or we don't have sufficient evidence to support it. So we conclude we have, I won't just say sufficient, strong evidence. The target market share has been exceeded. So we do have evidence for that. Can we be wrong? Absolutely. So since we rejected the null hypothesis, the kind of error that we can commit is type one error. What's our actual risk of committing type one error? We set a limit of 5% for ourselves. That is not the p-value. That is just the significance level. What we consider significant, 5% or less. But, we have a probability of type one error. So we have a possibility of type one error. because to commit type one error, you must reject the null hypothesis. So possibility of type one error, where the probability of type one error, P type one error is actually less than 0 0.001. The probability of type one error is always your P value. All right? The possibility or probability of type one error is the p-value. So that's the actual risk that we will take in committing type 1 error, less than 0.1%. What's the limit we set for ourselves? Alpha, 5%. You see, you could reject the null hypothesis as long as the risk you're taking is less than 5%. We're going to take point, less than 0.1%. So we're good to go. So that's the first part of that question, and it is a single sample problem. Let's look at the second part of that question and see what we got. So part B. Part B of this question says, last year in a similar study of 520 consumers, 52 had purchased Nova Cheddar. 52 out of 520. So that's basically 10%. So clearly, the evidence is suggesting that there's been an increase over last year. Because last year, 10%. This year, we're now 20%. So 
So at a 10% level of significance, is there any evidence to suggest that Nova, Nova Cheddar, sorry, a Nova's share of the cheddar chief market in Nova Scotia, it's a tongue twister, has changed in the past year, has changed in the past year. So this is now not asking that it has increased, it's just asking, has it changed? So it have gotten worse, it have gotten better. In which case, that's a two-tailed test. And is it a one sample test or two sample tests? Well, we had a new sample that was taken, 380, and we got 76 people bought Nova Cheddar. And now we've been told last year, 520, out of 520 people, 52 actually bought Nova Cheddar. So we do have a second sample. So last year, it's treated as one population. This year, a different population. So you could put down the following information. We'll use one, um, we could use, yeah, we could use two for this year, or new for this year, and old for last year. So we could say N new, which is the, the one we talked about, 380, and P new, bar new, was 0 0.20. We had an X value, I should say X, which was the number of people who bought it was 76. So the way in which we got the 20% was 76 over 380. Last year, and old, we had 520 people. X was 52, the number of people. And so therefore, P bar old is 10%. So that's the data that we have from this question. So we want a hypothesis test where not it has actually changed. So let's set it up. Step one, hypotheses. So either the... Um, the, there has been a change in the market share or there has not been a change in the market share. So what we want to prove is market share has changed. This is market share has not changed. So if the market share has not changed, H-O-H-A, it means the proportion of people who bought cheese last year and the proportion of people who bought cheese this year are the same. So in terms of a difference, let's do new minus old is zero because they're the same, it has not, not changed. But if there's been a change, the proportion, the new proportion, is now different from the old proportion, so they're not the same, right? In which case, what I need to do is to write minus PO is not equal to zero. So that's the first step, hypotheses. Any questions from anyone? Everybody's here. Are you hearing me? Yes? Cool. All right, thanks. So that's the first step. Second step is our test statistic. Now, this is going to be interesting because we have to introduce something that's kind of sort of a, what we call a pool sample proportion, just like the same way we had the pool sample standard deviation. So the test statistic, and it always follows this very same pattern, which is sample minus population. And what that really is, is the sampling error. We're actually measuring the difference between the sample value and the population value. So when we took X bar minus mu or P bar minus P, we're saying P is the population value or mu is the population value. And P bar is our sample, X bar is our sample. What's the distance between those? We call that the sampling error. That's the statistical term for it. 
And is that error in the measurement big enough for us to say, whoa, that sample is not representative of that population. And we measure that by the numbers kind of deviations. That's what gives us a T or, or Z value, all right? So if we're gonna measure it in terms of the number standard deviations, we must divide that error by a standard deviation, or which we call the standard error. So it's the sample value minus population that gives us the error. And then when we divide that by the standard error, we are measuring that difference in standard deviations. That is the, that is the pattern that we've been working with all along. So our test statistic, would be what's our sample. So our sample difference would be P new, P bar new minus P bar old. That's the sample difference. Population difference would be P new minus P old. You gotta keep it in the same order. Now, what's our standard error? <clears throat> Our standard error should look something like this. I'm just going to just draw it on the side and then I'll erase it. It should look like P nu, one minus P nu over N nu, right? So it's kind of like when you have the single sample problem, you had P one in times one minus P over N. Well, now we're going to have P N one minus Pn over Nn, which is new. And P old, one minus P old over N old. But I cannot use that. And why is that? I can't use it because I cannot use it. Hang on one second, let me just, oops, sorry. I cannot use it because I don't know the value of PN and PO. If I did, why would I be hypothesizing a difference between them? I would just know what the difference is. If I knew the population proportion for new versus population proportion for old, I don't need a hypothesis test to tell me if the difference is zero or the difference is not zero. The only reason why I'm doing this is because I don't know what they are. But I'm hypothesizing that they're the same in HO. So it could be 10% and 10%, 15% and 15%, 20% and 20%. But I don't know exactly what they are. Which, in which case, I cannot use, I cannot use the population, um, this, this formula over here. So I have to replace it by the sample values, right? The sample values. But I still have a problem. Well, what's that problem? My sample proportion P bar N and P bar O, by virtue of the null hypothesis, are expected to be the same. Because the null hypothesis says, the two population proportions are the same, but yet when I got a sample, they're different. So how could I estimate two things that are the same with two different values? That doesn't make sense. That is the same argument that we had when we say, let us assume population variances are the same. And if we assume the population variances are the same, we could not use two different sample standard deviations, S1 and S2, to estimate Sigma, what we did was we pooled them together and then got one estimate. The same thing we have to do here. We cannot use two different sample proportions to estimate a single population proportion. Because what we're saying is that Pn from here, Pn is equal to PO, is equal to, so we're saying Pn is equal to PO is equal to some value of P. Right? Because we see that they are equal. And that's why the difference is zero. And so if it's equal to some value P, then what we should have in here is not 
P bar N, one minus P bar N, P bar O, one minus P bar O, we really should just have our best estimate of P. So I should be removing the bars. And I should also be removing the O. I should be doing that. But since I don't know what P is, I have to now estimate P, oops, sorry, by P bar. And P bar is that single value. So how do I get P bar? I must now estimate it from my sample proportions. So P bar is called the pooled sample standard deviation. Oops. All well, these things keep coming up there. P bar is the pooled, not standard deviation, pooled sample proportion. We obtain, we calculate it as follows. P bar is equal to X. In this case, it will be X old plus X new over N old that's n new, n new. So what we do is we take it, we just combining all of the, uh, we're combining the two samples together, all of the people who bought cheddar from the two samples, and the two pop and the two sample sizes and creating a single sample, and that will give us what we're looking for, and we call that p bar. So in here, we will have p bar, and because p bar into one minus P bar is common to both. We could factor it out. One minus P bar, one over N old, one over N new. It's kind of looking like that formula we had with the pools um, sample standard deviation, right? So because you will find the very same term in both of the numerators, I could factor it out here and then have one over n zero, which is old, and one over n new. So that's my test statistic. And we use that test statistic whenever we have a zero. Whenever Pn minus, um, P1 minus P2 is zero. So that is expected, that is zero, sorry, zero over here. Right? Because we've assumed that those proportions are the same. So that's our test statistic. Let's move on to step three. The decision rule. So in this case, we have to ask, is it a one-tailed test or two-tailed test? If we go back here, we'll see that it was a two-tailed test was a two-tailed test. And so we have to draw the, this, the rejection region in both tails. Anybody, if, if you're not following me, please stop me and ask me a question. Just turn on your mic. So it's a two-tailed test. In which case, this is alpha over two, alpha over two. And for this problem, we were told use 10% significance level. So that's 0 0.05, 0 0.05. By now, you know, for the normal distribution, if you have 5% in each tail, then that should be 1.645, negative 1.645. So this, these are our rejection regions right here. And in the middle, we fail to reject. So if our Z observed, is greater than 1.645, or if Z observed is less than negative 1.645, we will reject the null hypothesis. So that's the decision rule. Or if the p-value, the p-value is less than 10%, we will reject HO. I actually put in I realize I 
put in the decimal, and then I put it up as a percentage. All right, so that's step three right there. So those are the three important steps. The last thing we got to do is now um, do the calculations. Wow, one before the last. Let's see if we can get that done. So step four, analysis. You may recall that um, for the new um, population, we had a sample proportion, PBA, new of 0.2. We had an X new of 76 and an N new of 380. Then we had PBA old from the year before was 10%, which came from X old being 52 and N old being 520 consumers. So we're going to need to calculate our pool sample proportion by combining those two. So we'll take the 76 plus the 52 and then divide that by 380 plus 520. What do we get? We will get uh, 512, 128, if I'm not mistaken, over 900. Yeah, 120. Over 900, which gives us 0 0.1422, 0 0.1422. And so that's our pooled sample proportion. So now let us look at our Z value. Z value is 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1. So I'm putting the new minus the old because I want to take the smaller value from the bigger value, right? Minus zero, which comes from the null hypothesis, H zero, which tells us that the difference is zero. And then we will put 0 0.1422 times point, let me say eight, five, seven, eight, 1 over 380 plus 1 over 520. And we end up getting a Z value of 4.24. So that's a, a fairly large Z value. So as you could see, this is larger than 1.645. And so we're definitely uh, going to reject the null hypothesis. So if I were to draw, let's use a different color. Let's use green. So if I were to draw that 4.24, I am in the rejection region. Where you see my green up here, 4.24. And so my, this green region I'm shading right here, the same way that on the right side I have alpha over two, that would be my p-value over two. It's only half of the p-value, which means that the other half is down here, negative 4.24, which is a similar kind of measure as that one. But that would be the other half of my p-value, right? So all I now need to do is to Calculate what that area is and multiply it by two, and then I get the actual p value. But we don't have 4.24 on the table. So p value is twice probability of z greater than or equal to 4.24. Since we don't have 4.24 on the table, but we know that 4.24 is less than 0 0.001, so if we multiply that by two, then we have our p-value being less than 0 0.002. So p-value is less than 0 0.002. And then last step is step five. So five, 
decision, conclusion. So, so since, since the 4.24 is greater than 1.645, or since the p-value is less than 0.002, we will reject the null hypothesis. What do we conclude? We conclude we have sufficient evidence that there is a difference uh, or that um, the share has changed, all right? Market share has changed. We have strong evidence market share has changed. Cool, what kind of error can we commit? Since we rejected the null hypothesis, only kind of error that we could commit is type one error. Type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. And so as a result, since we, um, since we rejected the null hypothesis, the only error we could commit is type one. What's the risk of committing type one error? It's our p-value less than 0 0.002, in which case we know that that is less than 0 0.1, which is 10%, and we will reject the null hypothesis, all right? So that is our observed significance, less than 0 0.002. 0 the significance we set for ourselves was 0 1.0, no, 0 0.10, sorry, the 10%. All right, and that's that question. Last question is um, also interesting, which is part C to that. Part C says, at the beginning of last year, management had set a company objective of increasing market share by at least 4%. All right, so let me go to this part right here. That's part D, I'm actually skipping part C, I realize, but I'll come back to part C. Passy said, if you'd solve the problem in part B using the classical approach, what would the value of your Z critical be? Well, you notice that I always find Z critical, so I did, which was 1.645, and then you would compare that to Z. So we actually have both the p-value and the critical approach in the last question. So we don't have to do that. We've already done it. So part D, if we read that, it says, at the beginning of last year, management set a company objective of increasing market share by at least 4%. At the 10% level of significance, is there evidence to suggest that that goal has been achieved? So now that's different. The other, the other problem we just finished basically asked us to check whether or not there was a change. But now we're looking for a specific change. Was that change 4% or higher, right? So, HO, HA, one, hypothesis, then that P new minus P old is less than or equal to 0 0.04. That is, we did not achieve it. But P new minus P old is greater than 0 0.04. Now, somebody who will be looking at this and say, but it says at least 4%. Doesn't the equal to sign have to be in the alternate hypothesis? We never have the equal to sign in the alternate hypothesis. It has to be in the null hypothesis. So we just basically take that equal sign out of there and put it in the null hypothesis. And you might want to argue, but you know, we're not including that 4%. Because we now HA is saying strictly greater than 4%. But if you want to, you could actually rewrite 0 0.04 as 0 0.03999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
Mm. I'm just going to abbreviate that. The goal achieved, the goal not achieved. And we have to know what goal we're talking about, not achieved. Two, test statistic. Now, what's interesting is that we're no longer assuming in the null hypothesis that the two proportions are the same. We're just assuming that they have a difference of 4% between them. So it could be 20 and 24%, 10 and 14%, 15 and 19%. We just don't know what it is, but we just know that we're looking for a difference of at least that. So in which case, we will just use P bar N minus P bar new, sorry, old. And from the null hypothesis, we gotta get this value right here, the difference, 0 0.04, right? Divided by, and then we have no choice but to use the sample values that we have, P bar N, one minus P bar N over NN, P bar old, one minus P bar old, over and old. So we are not using a pool sample proportion now, we are using the individual proportions because we are not assuming that those two are equal in a null hypothesis. As you can see, we're saying is 0 0.04 or less. So what we do is we'll set the difference to 0 0.04. If we set the difference to the boundary, then clearly PN and PO are not the same, right? but they have a difference of 4% between them. So that's step two. Now, as you could tell from this diagram, or this diagram, HA, yeah, that's a directional test. That's a one tail test. And it's over in the right tail, not the left tail. And we want to test at 10%. So let's um, do step three, the decision rule. You're probably getting tired of all of these steps now. Um, the decision rule, so not, not enough, but the sampling distribution is normal. So right tail test, and alpha is 0 .1, uh, 0 .1, 0, sorry, 10%. So if that's 10%, what's our critical value? Z critical is 1.28. You could go and test it. I just know it off the top of my head, but you could go and test it. Look at uh, point 0.9 for this area and go look at the table. So that is 1.28. So if our observed Z value is greater than 1.28, reject the null hypothesis. Or if P value less than 10%, reject. HO. So I usually just put in both decision rules, one based on the p-value approach, the other one based on the classical approach. So that's um, step three. Step four. And all we got to do is just substitute the values that we had, which we had was um, Z observed is 20% minus 10% minus 4%. See, that comes from the null hypothesis. And we had 20% um, times 80% over 380 plus 10% times 90% over 520. And we got a Z value of 2.46. So we will reject the null hypothesis with that. Our p-value, because it is a one-tail test, the p-value is the probability of z greater than or equal to 2.46. And so we gotta look that up in the table. Our table usually goes up to 3.09. So therefore we should be able to find 2.46 in the table. And 2.46, I believe, um, when we check it out, the area that we will get. So if you just look up negative 2.46, you get the area in the tail right away. Turns out to be 
0069. Now, if you want to, what you can do is, uh, well, yeah, you got to look at 2.46. 2.46 will give you the area, and you can subtract it from 1, in which case I think that area will be uh, 0.9931. So 1 minus 0.9931 is um it will give us the point zero zero six nine all right so point nine nine three one is what you will get when you look up two point four six and that's for this part of the distribution subtract it from one you get the area in the tail all right and let's just so that's a p value and now we could do step five and finish up this problem So five, decision, conclusion. Since 2.46 is greater than 1.28, we reject the null hypothesis. Or the p-value approach, or since 0 0.0069 is less than 10%, reject the null hypothesis. So that's also the p-value approach. And what do we conclude? We have sufficient evidence that the market share increase, the goal of increasing market share by four percent, at least 4% has been achieved. We have sufficient evidence the goal of 4% or higher market share, not 4% or higher, sorry, an increase of 4% or higher, of 4% or higher increasing market share was achieved. All right, so there we go. Can we be wrong? Yes, what kind of error? Type one, because we rejected the null hypothesis. What is our risk of type one error? 0 0.0069, because that is the observed risk. If we accept this hypothesis, the chance of being wrong is 0 0.0069. Still a chance, but it's very small. So therefore, we can afford to gamble. So folks, that finishes up chapter 10 for us, because chapter 10, we wanted to cover off difference between population proportions. And we have two scenarios, one in which in the null hypothesis, the assumption would be that the two population proportions are the same. That was the first case we dealt with, where we're just interested in is there a difference or is one greater than the other? So in the null hypothesis, what we will do is we will assume that they're the same. And then we have the second case where we are not assuming that the two population proportions are the same because we are interested in a difference, a, a specific difference between them. And that difference in our case was 4% or higher, in which case they're not the same and we use a slightly different formula. So I want you to look at your formula sheet and make a note of that because the formula is a little different for these two situations. And much the same as when we assume equal population variances, we have a slightly different formula for the t-value versus if we don't assume equal population variances. And the T, the T the T value is slightly different. All right. So that's that finishes chapter 10 for us. Any questions? Let me just see there.